Okay, it looks like um, everybody's here that's going to be here, um, so I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Warner Losh. I work for Netflix, and I've spent the last several months exploring the mysteries of CAM. When I submitted the talk, um, I had this rather boring title, um, uh, NDA, the NVMe uh, CAM attachment. Um, and if you want to grab the slides, they're uh, available right now, if for some reason you want to follow along at home. But the real title of this talk is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love CAM. <laughs> um, because it kind of reminded me of a uh, uh, bit of a wild ride that the folks in the bomber took when uh, everybody went crazy in that uh, Dr. Strangelove movie. So, <clears throat> Like I said, I work for Netflix. Um, most people here probably have heard of Netflix. Um, has anybody ever watched Netflix online in here? Okay, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, how many on the FreeBSD laptop? Can you raise your hand, George? Uh. <laughs> we know who to call to get the right string in so that the browser works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Anyway, um, Netflix runs its own um, CDN. Um, I believe a few other people in the room that don't work for Netflix also run CDNs. Um, is that right? Um, do, I have any, do I have anybody from? I guess not. OK. Anyway. One of the things that we do at Netflix is operate at a fairly large scale um, as well. We have, uh, is it 75 million yet, Scott? The number of subscribers worldwide? Something like that. We, have, we don't have 100,000 yet. There would be a party for that. 100 million, sorry, 75 million. Um, so, uh, we need to anticipate the future. So um, when we're streaming uh, in the evenings, uh, according to Sandvine, um, about one third of the internet traffic, I think 39% in their last report, is Netflix-related videos. Um, so we're streaming terabits of second um, from all of our machines, all our thousands of machines around the world. Uh, this is a picture of um, some of our storage boxes. Uh, that we have just racks and racks and racks of. So when we started the CDN, we had uh, a bunch of storage boxes with hard disks um, with some flash to boot off of. Then we thought, well, flash is fast. We need to build some offload devices, some flash storage de devices. Hmm. Anyway, uh, we built some flash storage devices based on SSDs. And those... Um, those worked out for a while, and then we got faster machines and needed a faster interconnect. So um, along with the rest of the inter industry, we're transitioning away from SSE drives to NVMe. And um, these happen to be Intel drives. Um, we may or may not be using Intel drives in our product, uh, but it was a picture that I had. They come in two form factors, either the uh, hard disk lookalike form factor, which has the PCI lanes in a special cable uh, to it, or in an actual PCI board. OK. Maybe I'll just do this. <clears throat> um, so why, what's motivating the move to NVMe? A lot of people uh, probably have heard about this, uh, yet the reasons for going with NVMe have, have not been well explained, perhaps. So, um, when you have spinning disks um, connected via SAS or SATA, uh, you have a very high latency, so it doesn't matter how much protocol overhead you have. Um, the uh, long bar you know, clearly shows that you have like 20 milliseconds of latency and then microseconds of protocol and software overhead. Uh, but as devices got faster and faster and you wanted to increase uh, IOPS, and increase bandwidth, uh, the software time and the protocol time started to matter a lot. So Intel went out 
and designed uh, NVMe Express to try to overcome some of these limitations. Um, and this graph shows the second generation card that has like a 60 microsecond latency. Some of the uh, latest Gen 3 cards actually get down to 10 or 15 microseconds of latency. Uh, so any software overhead, which used to be um, just in the noise, is now uh, can be a significant part of the, the latency. Um, FreeBSD can get full bandwidth from um, the NVMe cards that uh, uh, we've been using, um, thanks primarily to Drew's efforts um, at uh, optimizing our whole uh, network stack. Um, we get good latency with FreeBSD, but we still need some optimization. We have about, at about 30 microseconds. We could optimize out maybe another five or 10 um, if we look at the uh, stack uh, that we have on FreeBSD uh, a little more closely. So one of the big questions I always get asked when I tell people I've done this, hey, I, I wrote a NDA, or I wrote a um, CAM front end for NVMe. People are like, why? Um, there already is a disk front end for NVMe that Jim Harris wrote, and uh, it seems to work fairly well. Well, this is true, but when we were evaluating NVMe, it uh, became obvious to me fairly quickly that it would be very difficult to take advantage of the I.O. scheduler that I had written for CAM uh, to adapt it for the NVMe, uh, NVD driver. Um, one thing to know about Netflix is um, we like to buy the lowest cost uh, drives that are performant. And sometimes um, that low cost, you get kind of what you pay for. We can put more drives in the system. That gives more redundancy. So if there, we buy drives that happen to fail a little bit. If one or two drives fail, we still have enough drives in the system to drive traffic um, and to you know, have it be a useful system. But usually what happens is we'll, we'll get the drives in everything looks good, we'll deploy it, and then we'll find some scenario in our workload where the drives are quirky. Oh, it can write uh, at full speed only for a while, and once you write 10 or 20 gigabytes, the drives no longer behave at full speed. Um, if you give it too many writes at the same time, it can have problems due to the um, problems with the firmware of the drive. So the I.O. scheduler that I wrote and talked about last year, smooths out all the performance quirks. And, and we figured we would need to do this if we were deploying in VME. Um, so this talk will be a little bit about how I did it, but primarily it will be about CAM, um, all the pieces of CAM, how CAM fits into the system, um, a little bit of uh, the, the bigger part of the I.O. stack so you can uh, understand what, uh, what CAM's role is in that. Uh, as well as uh, understand the code while we're, um, if you were to go look at it. So we'll start with the FreeBSD I.O. stack. Uh, this is a picture that I took and adapted from Kirk's and George's uh, book on the design and implementation of FreeBSD. I simplified it a little bit um, and added the upper and lower designations. Um, and added um, the different pieces of CAM as well as a couple of the other drivers that are in the system or that uh, don't use CAM but do similar things. Um, <clears throat> so this should be familiar to, to most people. Um, the upper part of the stack, which was the top part of the picture, um, primarily focuses on the VM system. It's the buffer cache of the system. This is what allows you to touch pages and eventually they wind up on disk. Um, but the actions in the upper part of the system are loosely coupled to the lower part of the uh, file system stack. Um, that means that um, if I make a page dirty at the upper layers, um, Maybe it'll get flushed to disk now, maybe it'll be flushed to disk later, maybe I can um, change it a few more times, but there's not a direct, I touch the page and it goes to disk. Um, at the next layer down is Geom, uh, which handles partitioning and stuff. Um, you can go look at one of Paul Henning's talks uh, about that if you wanna learn all the details of Geom. I'm just gonna touch on it lightly here. 
um, because CAM fits in underneath GEOM. And CAM handles queuing and scheduling of I.O., uh, handles freezing the queues when there are errors so that error recovery can happen and then I.O. resume. Um, it enforces different rules about um, what you can send to the drives, what um, the hardware in the system can support at any given time uh, as well. If there are limitations, if you have a lot of disks on a particular, particularly an older um, disk controller, or SCSI controller, you might, the disks might be able to do a bunch of I.O., but the controller can only have so many outstanding I.O.s at once. So CAM handles all of that um, behind the scenes transparently to uh, the user. Um, last year I talked about the CAM I.O. scheduler. Uh, I wanted to include pointers to that this year um, in my talk uh, so that people can go find it, uh, maybe watch the YouTube of it uh, as well. Uh, if they wanted to read about uh, the I.O. scheduler in more detail so that they can understand, so you guys can understand why we wanted to, to use it. Basically, it, it collects uh, real-time statistics that we find useful and helpful in managing our systems, as well as uh, shaping traffic uh, to the drives to keep the drives from saturating and going into overloaded, uh, into a mode where they're overloaded and don't perform well. Okay, so uh, when I was preparing this talk, I, I realized that there are a lot of things that are going on in the system with CAM that um, depend on the upper layers but aren't actually part of CAM, so I thought I'd touch on that uh, just briefly. Um, the design and implementation book covers the buffer cache and the upper layers fairly well, uh, so I thought I'd just start there. Um, you have a file system or maybe a, a, a swapper or pager that's uh, paging things in and out, uh, reading and writing things to the disk, um, and it calls a bunch of stuff that eventually winds up as a B read or a B write which uh, calls the strategy routine for the um, <coughs> buff obj. And that winds up calling into geom. So the red part here, the blue part is the buffer cache. And then the red part is uh, geom where uh, it, it converts the struct buffs to bios and then sends it down um, uh, through all the layers and eventually winds up at the geom disk layer at the bottom uh, with a bio that's going to go to the disk exactly ready for the driver to deal with it. Drivers don't have to deal with partitioning, they don't have to deal with striping or anything. By the time the driver gets the command, it's ready to go. It's get this block, get this length, and go. And that's the layer that I'll be talking about for the rest of the talk, the cam layer. Um, another way to look at CAM is that uh, we have um, the request coming in the top and they're dealt with by the perif drivers. A perif driver, I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail, all of these things in more detail, but briefly, a perif driver is a driver that takes I.O. requests and turns them into some kind of protocol. It, it will take a, a, a block read and turn it into a SCSI read 10 command or a, an ATA command um, or a tape command um, or it will take an ioctal with a protocol block already formed and just pass it through. Um, it passes it off to the transport layer. One of the things that took me a while to understand uh, with CAM a long time ago when it was first committed was I saw all these XPT things and it's like XPT what the heck is that um, and that's just transport and the transport is responsible for taking these protocol blocks and giving them to uh, the somebody that can actually talk to the hardware and that something is called a SIM uh, it's a system interface module uh, the name is the same for ATA or SCSI or whatever I listed a few of the SIMs. I thought about listing them all, but um, we have like 30 or so in the tree right now, and that would make the slide ugly. But the SIM uh, takes the requests from uh, the transport layer, um, sets up DMA to send the request blocks to read data, write data, 
um, whatever, it gives it to the hardware, um, at, as you see at the bottom of the screen, and then the hardware does its thing, the drive does its thing, and eventually an interrupt happens, and then the process reverses. Um, the SIM notifies the perif that the uh, I.O. is done, the perif calls bio done, it goes up the stack, calls uh, buff done or one of the variations of it and the I.O. completes. So I was talking about the different layers of CAM. I was talking about uh, the perif, talking to the XPT, talking to the SIM. And all that's done through a, a generalized message passing system called CCDs, command control blocks. These are the, the, the messages that flow back and forth between the various parts of CAM. Uh, they're present as one giant union of all possible messages so that um, the action routines that I'll talk about later have a nice simple prototype and don't have to uh, cast void pointers. Um, it helps with type safety a little. When you create a CCD and hand it off to be executed, um, some of the commands will execute right away. You can ex the, ask the transport layer about details about the transport. And the transport layer goes, oh, I know those, fills in a little structure and completes the uh, CCD. Uh, others obviously are queued. I want to read a block off of the disk. Well, you hand that off, um, it goes down to the SIM. The SIM can't complete it right away but it starts it, marks it as started, and returns. Um, and then when the controller finishes the I.O., uh, it will complete the CCD. Uh, we know about the um, users of, of, of the CCDs know that the CCD is completed because there's a callback routine that gets called. Um, in some cases, uh, you set up the CCD you call uh, done on the CCB, and that done routine actually does the thing that uh, is, uh, that, that's requested. Uh, it's almost like you're just completing it, and as a side effect, you get the information you want. Uh, that's one of the things when you go off and read the CAM code that can be a little confusing. It's like, I just, this, this bit of code set up the CCB and then called done. Well, how does that work? Well, if you see the callback routine that it does and go look at that. All the work gets done in the done routine. Um, and once a CCB is completed, uh, we have a number of status um, that's basically two parts. One part tells uh, whether it's successful or not, and the other part tells details um, of how it was successful or unsuccessful. Um, so I, I also talked about um, the different layers, uh, the messages that pass between them, but I didn't talk about how um, what glues them together. Um, CAM paths are what glue them together. Uh, they describe uh, different uh, nodes in the tree. Uh, <coughs> and all the physical objects in the tree may have one or more paths. For example, uh, in the system I'm running, I have the pass-through uh, driver and the DA driver uh, to talk to my um, two SSDs. And as you see, both of them at the bottom here in the cam control dev list, as you see, both of them have both a um, DA object to, or DA driver attached to them and a pass-through driver uh, attached to them. Um, and you can talk to the physical devices in a number of different ways. And cam's paths help deal with that. Um, we ref count the topology, so as more instances, um, more drivers attached to a particular instance, we get, we're, we're able to keep the resources around if other drivers go away. Um, it used to be the case before, we, before all the bugs in the SCSI or the USB removal code got fixed. Yay! <laughs> that you'd pull a USB drive out and USB would do its thing perfectly or not, but usually perfectly after Hans has worked on it. And, um, but you'd get a um, you know, rough count uh, error, so you would not be able to detach it, and you'd have to reboot. Um, and that's what, this, that's, the, that's what this is a result of. The ref counts on the topology, there were bugs so that when things went away, the ref counts weren't being decremented, so you couldn't unload drivers. 
another piece for CAM that you need to know about is the async notifications. Um, and the async notifications are just a way to broadcast information or broadcast that something has happened uh, to different parts of CAM. And this is a very integral part of many things in CAM. It's used to uh, enumerate the drives. Um, it's used to attach device drivers to those drives. Uh, and it's used by the SIM to tell uh, attached drivers that something interesting's happened. Some devices need special handling after a SCSI bus reset, for example. And um, when the SIM detects a SCSI bus reset happening, it's supposed to send a bus reset asynchronous message. <coughs> Um, one of the things that's interesting about CAM is, relative to new bus, is the model of finding devices is a bit inverted. The SIM, which uh, you'd think would know about the devices, doesn't tell the rest of the system the devices are there. Um, the rest of the system tells the SIM, hey, Go scan for devices. And the transport layer finds the devices, um, gets all the information for them, and then sends, hey, I found a device to all the drivers that are listening, and they go do their thing. I'll get into that a little bit more detail. Um, in Newbus, in contrast, uh, Newbus would say, I'm in an attached routine. I know what's going on. I know what my children are, let me tell Newbus about the children, and then the children go off and probe and attach. So it's, it's, it's a little different uh, mindset. Both of these systems were created contemporaneously, um, and so each chose a slightly different way to, uh, to model the devices. Earlier, I, when I was talking about what CAM did for the system, one of the things I said was that it handled queuing. Uh, modern Disk drives have a number of slots that you can put IOs into. With uh, SATA, they're um, tagged, uh, to tag queuing. You have 32 slots, you put the IO in. Um, CAM's dev queue mechanism ensures that you never send more than 32 IOs down to the SIM for the drive. Uh, so you can't overflow it. Um, the SIM has to deal with it if you accidentally do, or for some reason through error handling, it winds up with more than it can handle. But for the most part, we try to pace it so that we always have just the right number of, uh, of requests in the drive. And this can be dynamically resizable. At Netflix, we, even though our spinning disks have 32 slots, we find we get better performance if we only use the first 16. So at runtime, we set it to 16. Other people uh, use this to say, well, I've, I've monitored the drive somehow. I, I know it can handle eight right now. And then later, I've monitored the drive some more, and it can handle 12, and uh, dynamically grow and shrink the number of commands that they allow. In addition, the dev queue can be frozen for error recovery. One of the interesting parts, unfortunately, that I won't get into too deeply today is in CAM, the uh, dev queue freezes and thaws for various parts of the system. So, when you want to submit IOs, but you know the, the underlying layers aren't ready, you can freeze the queue, submit IOs, and then when you know the device is ready, you unfreeze it. Um, this can happen during startup, but it can also happen during error recovery. The typical error recovery for most disk drives is um, cancel all the IOs that are present, do something special for that one IO that failed, and then resubmit the IOs. Well, the dev queue mechanism lets you freeze the dev queue, so you have all the devices there, no new um, commands will happen, and then you can go deal with the error recovery, and once that's done, you can unfreeze it, and all the normal mechanisms for queuing and stuff apply, and uh, you go from there. Yes? Um, when you have the queue paused, it's only a problem if you want, if IO needs to complete. So if you have a drive that's failing, um, sorry, the, let me repeat the question. The question was, are there error types where you have to worry about the queue filling up? 
And there are some errors, like if the hard drive is spinning or has a bad, uh, failing, I mean, has a bad sector on it. And you have to keep retrying that one sector, or maybe it's a, a group of sectors. The dev queue will likely fill up with other requests for, that people want to do while you're doing that error recovery. Eventually, you need to terminate the error recovery or the system becomes unresponsive because um, like most preemptive kernels, FreeBSD really wants to be able to do I.O. To, to do anything interesting. So now that I've talked about the various bits that glue um, the perif, the XPT, and the SIM together, let me delve a little bit more deeply into uh, those <coughs> into those devices. CAM peripherals, uh, like I said, implement some protocol. They take block I.O. requests. They take block I.O. requests and um, convert them to SCSI read requests or SATA read requests or something. But in addition uh, to that, they participate in device enumeration. And I'll, I'll get into exactly uh, how they do that um, over the next few slides. So, Once the perf driver has converted the I.O. request to um, the protocol blocks, the SCSI protocol, NVMe protocol, whatever, it hands it off to the SIM via the XPT. Um, I said that earlier. Um, it's a very basic mechanism, so it bears repeating. Um, once the SIM signals completion, it notifies up the stack that the I.O. that the I.O. is done. The transport layer, um, passes the messages back and forth between the perif and the sim, but it also uh, enumerates the um, drives or the devices that are on uh, a given sim. Um, it will answer uh, some of the CCBs um, that are asking about information about the transport, how fast it is and so forth. It will answer those um, as well. Um, I'll get into the probe device that the transport creates to, to enumerate devices in the system here in a little bit. Um, SIM drivers. Um, first of all, the S in SIM does not scan for SCSI. Um, for a long time I thought it did, uh, but I went back and looked at the original CAM uh, standards and they said system interface module from the beginning. I thought that that was a later um, thinking on your, the feet when ATA was added, but that was there from the start. Um, so it accepts the protocol blocks from the peripheral driver, um, writes them to the adapter, uh, and answers different questions uh, about the drive that it has figured out. So how does the SIM get created? One of the mysteries to me when I was first starting out with this was well, how does, how does how do, how do we get one of these going in the system? Um, it attaches to the new bus uh, device enumeration. In your attach routine, typically for new bus or in a routine that gets called in a deferred manner, um, you call, you create a uh, dev queue with um, sim, cam sim queue alloc. You create the sim and you pass it a couple of interesting things. You pass it the name, um, you pass it the dev queue you just created. Uh, and you also pass it a um, action routine for receiving CCBs um, that it'll deal with, and you give it a polling routine. Um, the polling routine generally is only used um, when we're writing crash dumps because we have, don't have interrupts running and we need some way to pull um, the SIM to see if the CCBs are done yet. After you create the SIM, you need to register um, each bus that the SIM supports. These days, it's usually a one-for-one one, uh, mapping. Uh, in the past, it, it's been many-to-one. So you do that with XPT bus register. Um, and it goes off, and it registers the bus and the global list that CAM maintains. And uh, then that allows you to 
participate in device enumeration. Um, you then create a, uh, a, a what's the CAM path for the device enumeration with XPT create path. But one of the things that I had to go looking for when I was preparing this talk was where does the XPT get created? Um, that's something that's handled automatically in bus register. It associates the transport to the bus uh, by asking uh, the sim what kind of bus it is. It sends a path in core CCB. It finds out what the um, type of bus it is. It sets up the function pointers uh, to do that. Uh, in CAM right now, there's no per transport uh, data. So it's just a, um, a function table pointer, um, sorry, a function pointer table that uh, will map um, for all instances of a particular transport type. And that's handled automatically behind the scenes. You don't need to do anything special. So one of, the, one of the areas that I had a lot of trouble understanding when I was working on the NDA driver uh, was how do the peripherals um, instantiate? And so I thought I would spend a little bit of time in this talk uh, going through that. Um, when the path is created uh, by the SIM driver uh, that I mentioned a couple of slides back, it sends out a path registered notification. Um, the <coughs> XPT drivers that have registered uh, for this, um, the probe devices for the XPT drivers get a notification and they kick off the whole process. Um, in the early part of boot, when interrupts aren't enabled, the um, path registered get queued up and get released later once interrupts are running and the devices can be discovered. Um, the, these um, path register notifications get turned into XPT bus scan CCBs that go to the transport layer, which kicks off everything. Um, the transport layer runs a bit of a state machine to query the device. I'll get to the state machine and, and what it is um, in a little bit. But uh, basically, uh, the transport knows how to ask all the devices on the system all the common information. So uh, the SCSI transport knows how to do the inquiry command and maybe some auxiliary stuff to make sure the device is there and real and fill in the internal data structures that the perif drivers will want to look at to see whether or not they want to claim this device. Um, similarly, for the ATA transport layer, it knows how to send identify commands. The NVMe knows how to get this information as well. Um, the probe devices um, receive this information. Um, and, okay, let me back up, sorry. Once the, once the XPT probe device has finished its state machine, it will send a, um, an asynchronous message, uh, AC found device. Um, all the device perf drivers on the system that uh, are listening for things will then take a look at the information that the transport has found and decide, yes, I can deal with this, or no, I can't. Um, in the example I gave earlier where I had an SSD that attached to the PASS device and the DA device, um, both of those drivers said, yes, I can deal with this. The pass-through device created an, uh, an instance of itself and the DA device created an instance of itself um, so they could handle, um, so they could handle the stuff that they handle. Um, the reason I have the pass-through device enabled in my system is the drives in that system generally are from vendors that wish, um, that send us firmware updates as we find problems. And the pass-through device is what CAM control uses to update the device. Otherwise, I just read and write blocks off of it 
um, with the DA device. So why is the probe a complicated state machine? Um, primary reason is there two, is twofold. First, um, we can't block the, when you make a CCB request, it can't block waiting to complete. So the probe routine has to go, oh, I know that there's a device there. I need to send an inquiry command in the case of SCSI. Well, when it sends the inquiry command, it has to return right away. So it updates its state to a state that indicates it sent the inquiry command. When it completes, it knows, oh, I was in this state where I sent an inquiry command. I'll look at the inquiry command. And based on the details of that, it'll go to the next state. Um, the state diagrams uh, for the probe routines are a little bit complicated, so I'll go through a simple one and, and show you what at least my attempt at drawing SCSIs um, resulted in. Um, so the, that basically leads us to the second reason that the state machines are complicated is because the protocols are complicated. Um, if you're doing domain validation, you have to do some particular things in a particular order to make sure that you can get all the commands through. If you want to support tag queuing, you have to do particular things in a particular order. Um, and the state machines uh, deal with this. Um, it gets particularly complicated when you have enclosures and power management uh, and stuff, so you have to spin drives up or spin them down or turn enclosures on and off and do stuff that Ken could probably tell you a lot about. Um, but I looked at that and thought that would make a bad example and went to the next one to find a good example for a state machine. So the one good example I found was for was the one I just wrote. Um, and part of the reason for this is that the um, NVMe SIM uh, that I wrote, um, the NVMe drive, uh, sorry, back up a layer. Um, the NVMe driver has callbacks for when it detects de devices and so forth. So it does all the state machine stuff behind the scenes and then sends a notification, hey, I found it. So I was able to um, leverage that and, and have just a couple of states. We start off in the invalid state. Um, the first thing we do it, when we get a bus scan is we go to the identify state. Um, we look at the data that's present and um, do all the stuff to notify that devices are found and wind up in the done state. If at any time during this a reset comes in, we go to the reset state, which um, just then immediately goes back to identify. We could probably skip the reset state, um, but when I was writing this, I didn't realize that um, the reset state and the identify state are really the same state. Um, so I tried to draw the SCSI state machine. <laughs> it wasn't completely successful. This is uh, after. A transition. <laughs> I was about to add a disclaimer that uh, I'm sure I'm missing at least one. Um, but uh, do you know which one that is so I can add it? <laughs> But you know, this, this, this shows the whole glory of it. Um, I had, there's no good tool um, to do this. But you know, that talks about TUR is test unit ready. It goes into inquiry. Um, we uh, see if it has LUNs or not, and report all the LUNs and VPDs, and get the serial number, and do domain verification, and eventually, uh, after you run the sausage mill backwards, you've, dis you've figured out that you've got a device and you get to the done state. Um, but I invite you to go read the code if you'd like to A, fact check me, um, or B, um, understand what's going on. Um, and there's something similar for ATA. There are more states, I, and I couldn't fit that on the slide. So I, I'm not picking favorites here. I just chose this one as an example. <clears throat> so as I said earlier, we, um, when the perif driver is attaching, it gets the device found notification that is sent to everything. Um, it has an async notifier. Um, if you're looking at the NDA driver, it's NDA async. It finds the device that it gets and goes, oh, um, and asked the transport, oh, what kind of device is this? And it looks at some details and said, yes, I can deal with that. So then it creates 
um, a cam peripheral with cam perif alloc, and it passes a number of routines into that. It passes a register routine, a start routine, and some more that I'll get to in a minute. Um, typically, um, the register routine is like um, an attach routine in Nubus. Um, it allocates the soft C, initializes the IO scheduler, um, does a whole bunch of stuff. I've listed them here, and I want a little bit of time at the end for questions. So, um, uh, the interesting bits are that it registers an async event, uh, async callback for interesting um, events that might happen on that bus, and then it calls XPT schedule to get things started. Nothing happens in CAM without a trip through XPT schedule. XPT schedule is what um, is, is the mechanism that the dev queue that I talked about earlier uses to make sure that transaction slots are, are happening. And I believe I have a slide on it a little bit later. Anyway, here's a, a list of the required routines that you need to create a, um, a block device. Um, they're pretty standard. Um, most of these come from the disk interface, which um, I'm, most people are familiar with. The interesting one, in the, there, there are two here that are not part of the disk interface, though, that I'm going to call out. One is start, um, and that's called by XPT schedule when there's room for work. And the other is done. Um, and you could have a different done routine for each request type. Most of the drivers uh, in the tree just have one. Um, and that gets called when the CCB has completed. So XPT schedule checks to see if there's room in the dev queue. Um, if there is room, it allocates memory for the CCB and calls the peripheral start routine. Uh, the peripheral start routine goes, oh, I have a CCB. I can do work. Let me check um, the, you know, any work queues that I have. Um, and I'll, in a couple minutes, I'll get to where those work queues actually come from. Um, I have a nice picture here um, that I will uh, talk to. Um, the other thing that XPT Schedule does is if there's any shared resources that are limited. So if I've got a SIM that can do five requests at a time and I've got 10 drives attached to it, even though the drives can all do, obviously do at least one I.O. at a time, um, it don't, CAM will only ever schedule five I.O.s in that case. Um, because that's the limit of the, of, of the SIM driver. Um, a lot of these limitations are for older hardware, maybe less relevant today. Um, I know Justin has advocated uh, rewriting a lot of the scheduling to simplify it, um, to simplify memory allocation. Um, and that discussion is uh, an interesting discussion, but beyond the scope of this talk. Um, so when you're doing I.O., you create the CCB and call XPT action, and that pushes it down um, to the uh, XPT or to the SIM. When the SIM is done with a uh, CCB, um, it gets an interrupt. It sees that the I.O. is completed. It usually looks up in a, um, in a mapping table that says, uh, this cookie that I get an interrupt corresponds to this CCB I, so I can complete it. it. That calls XPT done. XPT done also calls XPT schedule. Um, and that's, you can wind up with really weird stack traces, particularly if you have bugs in your code, uh, I'm told. Um, <laughs> uh, so before the, the um, callback, the done callback finishes, your start callback happens, um, and that's so that we can overlap the I.O. in the uh, SIM a little bit better. Um, the other thing it can do, if there's an error, it can freeze the queue and requeue queue I.O. Um, so that they can be retried. Um, the strategy routine is like most normal uh, strategy routines. It gets uh, BIOS from the upper layers and queues them using um, either the CAM IO scheduler or BIO queue um, disk sort. Um, and then it calls XPT schedule to maybe go do that IO. Uh, so in CAM, everything gets queued once, and then it will get dequeued and executed. Um, that's 
part of the inefficiency that we'll need to address if we want to handle high transaction rates for NVMe. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think um, uh, Justin's idea of rewriting this layer is a useful one because we can generally know if we can call the start routine immediately and bypass the strategy perhaps. Um, Drew. It's, the si it's, uh, it's somewhere in between those two. Drew asked, what's the granularity of these messages? Is it max fizz? Is it a, a single disk block? Um, it's a single transaction. So usually, like for UFS, it might be 16K or 32K. Um, if uh, it's one of our systems doing a big read ahead, it could be as large as max fizz. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the size. Does that answer your question? or? Yeah, it, um, with 30 microseconds of latency, um, you wind up, if I'm doing the math right on my, in, in my head, with 30,000 IOs a second before you run into um, problems. Um, but if you're doing 30,000 IOs a second, you're going to consume an entire core just to do that um, and, and do the um, CAM processing. Um, in our systems, um, we're doing like 128K or 256K uh, transactions. So the transaction rate isn't a big concern for us. A little bit of um, inefficiency is not a huge deal, although I know you'll want me to get rid of it because um, every little bit counts. Um, but, but, you know, that's the, this, this is the primary reason why Justin thinks that um, you don't need to call XBT schedule to schedule the I.O., which queues and DQs, you can do it directly um, from the strategy routine. Um, so the start routine, you have a CCB, you know you have a slot um, in the sim to do I.O., so you fill it in and call XPT action and then call XPT schedule at the end to see if you have another slot, because sometimes multiple slots open up, um, multiple completions happen before you can get back to the um, system sometimes queues freeze, and um, when they thaw, you can get um, a bunch of stuff going on. This is also the place if you have complicated um, interaction between different types of I/O. In SATA I/O, for example, you can send a trim down, but it's not doesn't participate in NCQ. So either you send a trim down, and you can only send one trim down, or you send your I.O. requests down that are in CQ, um, and the start routine enforces that uh, restriction. Um, there, and yes, there is a newer in CQ version of trim, but you know, a lot of drives don't support that yet, so we still need to have code to deal with that. And then the, the, the done routine um, the, uh, uh, would be NDA done if you're looking at the source code. Um, and it's called by the sim as part of the XPT done processing. It also calls XPT schedule to see if there's a slot available. Um, and like I said, you can get some interesting inversions um, because it calls it before it calls the done routine. Or uh, the, um, sorry, um, wrong point. Um, the done routine sometimes also has to call XPT schedule because of the I.O. restrictions. If I am doing a trim in SATA and um, it completes, um, I have to call XPT schedule because I want to unleash any read and write I.O.s that have come in in the interim. And calling XPT schedule will kick it off. Everything gets clocked through XPT schedule. If your driver, if you're riding a perif driver and it's hanging, it never hurts except for performance sometimes, to call XPT schedule. Um, there were several bugs that I had when I was writing in DA. Uh, I guess I do know something about bugs. Um, there were several bugs that I uh, had with NDA where I wasn't calling XPT schedule. And the I.O. would happen, I would see that it was happening, and then it would never complete, and no another one would never start. And that was because I had left out calls to XPT schedule. Um, so here's the uh, kind of a picture of everything that I've been talking about. Um, 
where NIO comes in at the top in the middle of this into uh, NDA strategy. Um, so it queues the, the bio to the disk queue um, and calls NDA schedule. NDA schedule is a wrapper around XPT schedule. Um, if there are slots in the dev queue, um, XPT schedule calls NDA start, which then calls bio queue first to get the bio off of the queue. Um, the bio to CCB uh, translation happens here uh, as we pass it down. Um, and then it goes all the way down into hardware and comes back up. And uh, we get back to our done routine, which calls NDA schedule. And then to make more things happen, or it calls bio done to uh, complete the I.O. up the uh, storage stack. So when you're writing a sim, um, there are three routines that you need to write. Sim action uh, is there to handle the CCBs. Uh, I've talked about that. Um, again, there's the two types of CCBs, either the ones you queue to the device, um, to, they'll, will take a while to happen, um, or things you can immediately tell the um, XPT or the perif about the device. Sim pull is called um, when you've got uh, a CCB outstanding in the dump routines. Um, it's only used in dump, uh, although it could potentially be used elsewhere. Um, right now, we, we only use it when we're dumping the system. When the system panics and we're taking a dump, we disable interrupts. <coughs> I put that in for my nine-year-old uh, son. <laughs> um, so when the, the, the system's riding out a crash dump, uh, interrupts are disabled, uh, and we need some way to find that the I.O. is completed so that we can write the next set of blocks. And then the, the sim IRQ is what completes everything up the stack uh, and calls XPT done. So um, the key points um, I hope people take away from this. These were some of the harder things that I had to learn, although the first one was easy to learn once I realized. XPT means transport. Um, SIM scans the bus for devices, um, either when it starts or part of um, uh, path registered. The XPT probes the device by creating a special probe device, or probes the information about the device, creating a special probe device. Um, these probe devices go through a state machine to get all the information and then tell the perif drivers with um, a AC device found routine. Um, there may be many perif drivers that claim a single uh, physical instance of hardware, um, which is new bus can't do that. Um, CAM can. And CCBs drive everything. If you don't know about CCBs, you're going to have a really rough time understanding the CAM code. Um, and so I put this picture in. Um, to contrast with the uh, picture at the beginning that had in the middle um, NVD and uh, NVMe, um, this is what the IO stack looks like with the NDA peripheral, where we've got um, all the, dang it, my slide's are wrong. Um, this NDA XPT should be NVMe XPT, um, uh, but the layering is correct. Um, so this is the, the, the different layering when you enable the NDA driver. I, th I thought it might be interesting to, again, have another picture to see what's going on um, with this. And with that, um, I'd like to take any questions people have. Drew? Drew? Yes. I'm glad you asked that. The person you're sitting next to, Scott Long, maybe you know each other. <coughs> <laughs> um, he's been working uh, with me, mostly him though, on um, 
multi-queue extensions for CAM, so that instead of having a SIM queue or a um, dev queue, you can have one per CPU or one per CPU complex or whatever uh, makes sense. And in that case, then all of the I.O. wouldn't funnel through one data structure, which we all know from high core count experience is bad for performance. Each one could get their own, and they wouldn't contend on any locks to uh, manipulate that data structure. So um, that's a very good thing. And hopefully next year, Scott will present his talk on CAM multi-queue um, after doing the work and getting some phenomenal results. Okay, so um, when I put disk sort up, that that was an example of how you can schedule the I.O. The disk sort does the elevator algorithm, which you really need to do for spinning rust. But for flash, no, you just enqueue it as the first one or the last one and then take it off. Um, right, and, the, and the, the DA, ADA, and NDA drivers, um, the NDA driver doesn't do any disk sort at all. Um, and the, the other two, if it's um, got a spinning rate of zero, which means it's as an SSD, it doesn't do any disk sort either. So, uh, George. So, um, I started looking at some of the CAM entry and exit points. Um, is almost all of the work in CAM done at the boundary of those? Because then you can apply deep trace without having to statically define trace points to start working with those conclusions. Yes. Uh, so, okay, sorry, sorry, my mistake. Um, George was asking if all of the, he was looking at the cam routines and noticed that a lot of the work seems to be done at the boundary points. Um, uh, and the answer is, uh, and wanted to know if we could uh, exploit that to make it easier for instrumenting it with D-Trace. And the answer is yes. Um, cam has, I didn't talk about it today, but cam has a tracing routine that you can go through and see the CCBs um, going down and coming back up. And um, a lot of the code that's cam debug blah, blah, blah would be excellent candidates for dtrace. Um, most of it would be in cam xpt.c, although you would probably need um, a couple in each of the individual transports, the ATA xpt and the NVMe xpt uh, as well um, to make that happen. But it, it would not be a ton of work to, to make that happen. Um, right now, uh, so the, let me repeat the question. Um, Alexander wanted to know what the overhead of the um, NVD versus uh, NDA. Um, right now, NVD does things unmapped, and the NDA driver um, still has a bug where it thinks it can't do unmapped I.O. So with NVD, we see maybe 85 uh, gigabytes a second, or sorry, gigabits a second in our 100G machines. And with NDA, what were the best numbers? 65, 75? Right, right. So um, because of contention in the VM layer, we would get large latency spikes. So the control plane would slow down traffic to our system, so it was hard to see what the best peak you could get. But right now, there's a little bit of a performance difference because it doesn't do unmapped I.O. Um, and the 80 gigabits is off of four drives, um, four lanes, PCIe 4, so it's pretty close to line rate. Uh, yes, uh, Hans. Okay, so, so yes, um, so the question was, um, uh, is the state machine asynchronously callback driven? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, have you thought about making it synchronous, like uh, one thread per enumeration, so you can simplify it? So you don't leak reference time and such? Um, I don't know if anybody's uh, thought of doing that. Um, one of the things with CAM is all of this happens in parallel anyway. We can start this device and this device and this device and send all those requests down to the SIM. And as they complete, it goes to the next one. So we don't, uh, unlike Nubus, um, which has one synchronous thread to enumerate everything and you have to wait 
uh, for the next thing to come in. Um, CAM's enumeration model um, allows all of that to proceed in parallel across even multiple SIMs and, and, and drives um, and buses and, and, and everything. It can happen in, uh, um, in, in parallel so that you don't have to wait for that. Um, yes, Justin, the other Justin. Okay, um, so to briefly repeat the question, when um, HCI uh, completes a CCB, it marks it as innocent? Wait. It, it marks it if, if an error occurs. Mm -hmm. So if there's an error in CCB, if there's an error in CCB, um, it has to mark, or it marks all the others as innocent. Then oh, right, okay. So, um, so when the uh, HCI is completing the I.O., if it gets an error, it marks all the others as um, async. Um, because when an error does occur with uh, SATA, uh, automatically all the other requests are considered to have not happened and um, will return errors back. And so that reflects that. Um, I think I'll have to talk with you afterwards um, for the details, or you can talk with uh, Alexander, who wrote that code originally. Um, he's sitting two people down uh, from you um, to, uh, to, to resolve that. But I, I think that's a, a, a little bit more detail than I can go into up here. Um, uh, and I, I, so um, last question, yes. Okay, so the question was, can you print the uh, CAM tree similar to the um, GEOM methods that we have? Um, and there's CAM control dev list, which will list the devices, but I don't think we have anything that will um, print that in tree form. Ken or Scott or Justin, do, do we? I, Okay, just to repeat your answer since you're not mic'd, um, Ken said no, there's not. Um, and he's doubtful that there would be additional useful information apart from the linear list because CAM uh, tends to be bus, here's the things on the bus. Um, and there's not much more of a tree beyond that. Um, and you would need to dig down into the specific details of fiber channel or SCSI to find more complicated topologies to, to report back or to look at enclosures and that kind of thing. Okay, I think we're done with time. So um, if you have any other questions, come see me. Thank you very much.